All right. Uh, hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this special presentation hosted by uh, ERI student chapter here at the University of Nevada, Reno. So uh, today we are honored to have Dr. Garini from National Technical University of Athens, uh, Greece, as our guest speaker. Dr. Garini has kindly uh, agreed to join us today to share her most recent findings on the aftermath of the 2023 uh, Turkey-Syria earthquake, also known as Karaman Maras earthquake. She's been actively working on this topic uh, since this event happened, and she already published a preliminary report about this event that can be found online. Uh, before we start the presentation, let me uh, uh, let you know that at the end of the presentation, we are going to have time for questions and answers. So I will encourage you all to take advantage of this opportunity and ask any question you may have at the end. To facilitate this uh, question and answer session, uh, I will uh, like to remind you that you can uh, use the reaction button in Zoom to raise your hand and when it's your turn, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question and engage in a discussion with Dr. Garini. So uh, by this uh, brief uh, introduction, let me hand it over to Dr. Garini to start her presentation. Uh, Dr. Garini, thank you so much again for joining us today. Uh, so if you're all ears, please start your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ashram. I'd like to um, thank you and uh, your professor, uh, Mrs. Uh, Floriana Petrone, for the kind invitation and uh, for the enthusiasm that you uh, have shown uh, over the uh, devastating uh, uh, February 6th uh, events of the Kahraman Maras earthquake. Um, my name is Evangelia Garini. I am uh, currently on the uh, as a postdoctoral researcher in the geotechnical department of uh, civil engineering. This first photo is uh, from the uh, day of the earthquake in the Inskinderun port, uh, and you can see the fires. Um, I'd like uh, to start my presentation, and um, I'd like to pay acknowledgments uh, to of my collaborators to this uh, study. First, my professor, um, uh, Professor uh, George Gazetas, an emeritus professor in National Technical University of Athens. This is the one uh, with whom I've made my PhD and I'm doing my uh, research right now. Um, and second, uh, to Sissi Nicolaou, uh, she is a chair of Geo Institute of ASE and also uh, she's in uh, NIST and uh, she's uh, a very good collaborator of us in all the reconnaissance visits that we've done uh, after the earthquake. So the presentation contents in brief. The first part is a seismology, the epicenters, the rupturing of the fault, the tectonics. The second part is the strong motions that uh, have been recorded in these events, accelerograms, velocity time histories, and of course, response spectra, and some comparisons. The third part, the earthquake damage, of course, the structural and geotechnical uh, damage. And the uh, final part is the emergence of fault in uh, 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 on surface, on ground surface, uh, from site observation and also from satellite imaging and mapping. So without uh, further hesitation, let's start with seismology. Uh, these are a map from the Bogazisi University. You see uh, in red, this is uh, the Cyprus, and this is a part of Turkey that we're gonna see in a larger image later on. Uh, the first event with magnitude 7.8 uh, occurring during night of the 6th of February at uh, four, uh, AM uh, and later nine hours later on um, further up north close to Elazik, uh, a second great earthquake with magnitude save uh, 7.5. Uh, just uh, I want you to uh, notice that both of them were strike slip uh, events 
And that's why um, you can see the depth is quite swallow. Uh, swallow. It's uh, on uh, 10 kilometers and 12 uh, and, and 20 kilometers, quite uh, at the surface because of the nature of the faulting. Uh, here is a seismotectonic map. And um, you can see the Turkey plate here uh, that moves to the, um, to the uh, west and the North Anatolian fault up and then the East Anatolian fault with the aftershocks of the two uh, 7.8 and 7.5 earthquake. Uh, these earthquakes happen on the well-established East Anatolian fault uh, region. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is the Arabian plate that pushes the Turkey plate up. And this is the Zagros fault here. And then uh, there is the uh, African plate. Uh, the, this is the, um, the zone of the uh, Cyprian and Aegean arc. It's a, it's a subduction zone where the African plate subducts underneath uh, the uh, Eurasian plate. So it's a really earthquake prone area and the strong motion network of Turkey, a wonderful, wonderful network. Um, I mean, um, me, my, myself and my colleagues in Greek were very jealous of it, a great network, uh, 857 recording station. This is great. I mean. Um, as far as I know, only Japan, um, you in California and uh, Taiwan uh, have uh, such great, uh, such vast uh, networks. So this is the region that um, we're gonna focus. Um, and this is um, the uh, seismic uh, hazard map from the new Turkey seismic code of uh, 2018. And as you can see, uh, up in the north, the North Anatolian Fault, and here uh, the East Anatolian Fault, uh, very well known from the um, uh, seismo, uh, the seismotectonics of the region, and the, the seismologist uh, knew these uh, features and recognized it, and that's why in this region uh, the designing accelerations were high. Um, as far as uh, 0 0.66 Gs, 0 0.66 Gs. These are huge accelerations. So the uh, Turkey seismic code take care about these uh, high uh, hazard uh, seismic uh, zones. These are um, in uh, Google Earth. I just put the uh, aftershock of the first and the second earthquake. Let's uh, look at them in more detail. Uh, the first with a star, the first earthquake, um, 7.8, uh, closer to um, Pazarjik. Uh, one hour later at 5 a.m., um, an aftershock of uh, 6.7, and nine hours later, close to Elbistan on the north, the uh, second major earthquake of uh, 7.5. And down here, I put with, um, with this yellow star, it's an aftershock on um, the 20th of uh, February, two weeks ago, uh, a major aftershock, 6.5, closer to Antakya. And these are the um, fault systems that fractured uh, during these earthquakes. Um, just um, to let you know, um, you all know that uh, the fault magnitude um, it's correlated uh, straightforward to the rupturing area of the fault. And as bigger is the magnitude, as larger is the fracturing area. For our cases, the first event, the big event, uh, 7.8, um, lead to a fracturing length of almost uh, 350 kilometers, while the second one is much smaller. Uh, you have to remember, you have to recall that the Richter scale, the magnitude scale, it's not linear. So it's not uh, uh, the, the reduction in magnitude um, of, of linear scale. Uh, so a smaller half uh, the length. And here I just uh, show you a sketch. 
the uh, depth of the rupturing is uh, quite the same for both uh, cases. It's close to um, uh, 30, 40 kilometers, uh, as I will show you here. Um, there are the uh, fault studies uh, from the USGS. Um, and you can see for the uh, first earthquake, there is this first uh, small part, the first, the first, uh, the first segment uh, that it is very uh, close to Pazarzik. Uh, Pazarzik is here that uh, ruptured, and then um, there is a joint here that uh, gives rise to uh, a second segment faulting uh, and going up. Uh, north and the second one, an oblique, a second one that goes uh, down to Antakya, uh, going uh, backwards. Uh, but keep in mind that all these events are striped slip faulting and left, uh, left lateral. All of these are left lateral. Um, <clears throat> don't be um, uh, misleading by uh, these, uh, these vectors. These vectors just show how the fracture propagation goes, not uh, if they are left or right or lateral. And if we see this um, in uh, plane, the first segment, the small, the small segment in Pazarjik that gives rise to these two um, big segment rupturing, the one going up to Malatya and the second one going down to Andakia. And please, just Take notice here with um, with the uh, pink, with uh, the uh, purple color is the maximum rupture displacement. So the maximum uh, rupture displacement in this uh, segment, and more importantly in the segment that going that goes down to Antakya, it's very close to the surface the maximum displacement field is very close to the uh, surface. And this is uh, a first indication why we have uh, in such la large length the emergence of the fault in the uh, surface and also why this uh, earthquake is as devastating as it was. Uh, and let's go to the second one. The second one is uh, 7.5. And it is also bilateral rupture. That means a rupture that goes to two different directions, the rupturing. Uh, and we have a second and a third segment. And here, uh, just notice uh, in this first segment, um, um, segment that ruptures, how deeper is the profile of the maximum displacement field? We are not up. To the surface, we are in, let's say, 15 to 20 kilometers deep. Um, and this is an, also an early indication of why the second um, um, event was not as uh, devastating as the first and why it, it did not emerge in the surface uh, as the first was. Another two uh, phenomena, seismotectonic phenomena, uh, the first, uh, is the super shear uh, of uh, this first segment, this first small segment uh, that Aris Rosakis uh, from the Stanford University uh, has proven uh, to be true from the uh, seismograms of the stations. That means what super shear is. Super shear means that the velocity of the rupturing uh, propagation is larger than the uh, velocity of the uh, shear waves of the Raleigh waves uh, that prove that um, results uh, in um, a boom uh, on the uh, face of the propagation. And this was proven by Aris Rosakis. Also another uh, seismotectonic phenomenon is the fault branching. This is well known. Um, for example, um, James Rice in Harvard have studied such phenomena. Uh, and that means that um, the triggering fault rupturing goes to a joint and then uh, it, 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 it 
it uh, deflects. Uh, one part goes forward and the other one goes backward. Um, the similar thing happens to uh, 1992 Landers earthquake, which is uh, very well known to you all. And uh, James Rice, uh, among other uh, seismologists, proved that uh, th this fault branching effect uh, was uh, true. Just to, to let you know that these big earthquakes uh, are known to Turkey. I mean, uh, Turkey is a very seismic prone region. Um, in the last 100 years, in the last century, more than 21 uh, seismic uh, events larger than seven occurred in uh, Turkey. And just to uh, remind you, three of them, the most devastating of them. First, the Ajinchan earthquake, 7.8 here uh, on um, 1939 with uh, hundreds of victims. Uh, the, the other one, very well known, the 1999 in Zmit or the Pazari earthquake uh, closer to Istanbul. And of course, the sequence of the Kanharaman Maras earthquakes in 2023. So this was not um, something um, unexpected or uh, an, ex an extraordinary event for Turkey. Let's go to the second part about, uh, let's talk uh, a little about ground motion recordings. Acceleration time histories, velocities, near source effects, forward uh, directivity and elastic response spectrum. First of all, I personally and all my collaborators were very thankful to the Turkish colleagues and AFAD. AFAD is the uh, ministry that uh, has to do with uh, the network for the immediate and open publicizing of this huge number of accelerograms. It, they, they gave all the accelerograms from day one, from the 6th of February, in all the 800 uh, station. This is extreme. That's great of them. I mean, uh, we appreciate it. And this is the part of the station in the area of interest. And uh, with the red uh, line is the uh, fault of the uh, 7.8 earthquake. And as you can all um, uh, see, uh, the uh, stations are located on the uh, expected uh, fault because, because the seismologists knew uh, the fault, uh, knew the uh, seismic proximity and uh, what happens in this area. So they go and they put it like you put in uh, Landers and in Northridge uh, along uh, the expected uh, rupture, the, uh, the stations. And these are, um, just a summary of uh, what it was recording. Uh, on the vertical axis is the peak acceleration, and on the horizontal is the distance from fault. Distance from fault, not from the center, in kilometers. And um, you can see high acceleration in uh, percentage of G. And we are uh, more interested in a uh, near fault um, station in stations that are uh, closer to a distance of uh, 20 kilometers uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the fall. And let's see some uh, feature of these uh, strong motions along the fault rupture. This is the rupture in the map, and I will uh, demonstrate here. Uh, on this first segment, very close to Pazarjik, uh, the horizontal north-south component uh, on the top is the accelerogram and on the bottom is the velocity time history. And uh, apart from this uh, 0.5 uh, G of uh, peak acceleration, just, uh, just observe these two distinctive parts. Uh, these two distinctive parts, maybe it's the first part, it's the rupturing mm -hmm. here while uh, the second part, this part, it's the rupturing for, for the other uh, segments of the fault. And of course, uh, we have this huge, this is a huge velocity uh, pulse uh, with one meter per second as a peak 
velocity and this step, this velocity step, I mean, um, the late Professor Bertero and right now in uh, Stanford, uh, Professor Miranda um, have um, recognized such effects and um, they are um, in, in a lot of studies uh, say about uh, the detrimental effect of such uh, velocity pulses of, um, in this case, 2.2 meters per second. This is very destructive for any kind of uh, structure. Let's move uh, to Turkoglu. Uh, here, also great uh, values of uh, peak uh, acceleration. Uh, also, the two uh, distinctive uh, segments in uh, rupturing and the big velocity steps. And then if we move uh, down to Antakya, uh, okay, so now uh, something uh, should, uh, should feel wrong about that. I mean, look at this duration. This is uh, quite shorter than before. Look at this before and look at this now. This is shorter, but look at this huge monster in the velocity step three meters per second, three meters per second should, should hear to you like a UFO. I mean, in, in almost every other worldwide uh, recordings, we do not have such huge velocity steps. Uh, only Chi Chi in uh, 1999 earthquake in Taiwan, I have seen velocity steps of three meters per second. This is uh, detrimental for earthquakes. Uh, in, um, in Northridge, of course, uh, in Landers, um, we have uh, these large velocity uh, step effect, uh, but not three meters per second. We have 1.5, we have maybe two, but not three. This is huge. And, and another station, the same, the same picture. Uh, 1.5 G in the horizontal and almost three meters per second of velocity step. So what happens here? Well, this is what happens uh, forward directivity phenomena. The recorded motion of, um, of this event, uh, if they are of relative limited duration in Antakya, not everywhere, is due to the bilateral propagation, of course, first, yes, uh, the length, is reduced to two because half of it goes up and half of it goes down. First, this. But second is that in the southern part, in the region of Antakya, the records exhibit strong forward rupture directivity effects. And um, just to let you know briefly, to remind you what is the forward directivity effect, if we have um, the simplest case, which is the strike slip um, fault, which is our case in this particular uh, earthquakes, we have the fault line and the rupture uh, happening in this direction. Uh, so uh, the shear waves emanate from the rupturing uh, source and uh, they propagate to the space. And as they move uh, in the front, of the um, uh, front waves, uh, they emanate and they going to um, a side uh, towards the fault line uh, where what happens? The wave fronts generative in different time instances, tough one, tough two, tough three, arrive at the side in front of the rupturing uh, propagation at the same time. Why this happens? Because uh, tough one is later. It's in, um, let's say, uh, uh, there is happen the constructive interference of uh, waves, and that results in short duration of shaking. That's why um, this is uh, from Kanharaman Maras, uh, where no um, forward directivity effects are observed. And you can see the total duration. Uh, which is more than uh, six or 70 uh, seconds, which is uh, compliant uh, from su for such large earthquakes as 7.8. And in Antakya, uh, you can see the smaller uh, duration, only uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds are not for 7.8 earthquake. If a seismologist 
see this, it would um, uh, rebel. What happens? This is uh, the effect, this is the signature of um, uh, rupture directivity, that all the waves arrive at the same time in the same location, and each one adds to the next. And that's why we have large acceleration uh, pulses, well-defined acceleration pulses, and velocity pulses, as I saw you. So you, we have 0.8. Uh, G as a PGA, and we have well-defined velocity pulses of these huge step effects. That's the signature of the uh, near fault effects of forward directivity effects. And that's, um, let's say, um, <clears throat> that's a summary of what happens in Adakia. This is uh, from uh, Google Earth, a map of the Antakya and uh, the stations that um, were installed. And you can uh, see that in um, three or four of them, uh, peak uh, values of acceleration uh, close or over 1G. You can see zero point in, in, in station uh, 3125, it, the north-south uh, horizontal acceleration 0.82 Gs, while in the east-west 1.82 uh, 12 Gs and the vertical is also a, a great value over 1 G. The other station on the uh, on further south uh, also was big or even bigger 1 G and uh, the station uh, 3129 with uh, the biggest uh, big ground accelerations of uh, 1.35 uh, Gs in one direction, 1.21 in the other. And also in terms of velocity, uh, also huge numbers in velocity. These are really devastating uh, velocities. And these are just uh, peak ground velocities, not the velocity steps that we've shown before that it is in the order of three. So let's see uh, all the screen, all the components uh, here for the Antakya. Um, the uh, east-west, the north-south, and the vertical components. Um, we can see the short duration of the signal, which is um, representative of the uh, forward directivity effect, and also the well-established, well-defined, large velocity pulses in uh, both horizontal uh, directions with uh, 1.51 um, velocity steps and three. Uh, and this is uh, very, uh, a very better view of the destructiveness of these motions uh, can be seen for us civil, uh, civil engineers in the uh, elastic response spectra. Just take a moment and look at it. We have in both the north, in both horizontal components, we have spectral values over 1G for a vast period rate, up to two seconds. Let's go to another station. The same thing is true. Um, 1.21G, uh, the east-west horizontal, and 1.35, sorry, the north-south. Also big, large velocity steps. And in terms of uh, response time histories, also, uh, you can see the very demanding spectral uh, accelerations. Uh, also in uh, Hassa, this is uh, some, it's in the, in the same uh, province, which is Hatay, but it's uh, up north uh, a little bit. But here also you can see uh, these um, very well-defined velocity pulses and these uh, large velocity step uh, pulses, which are indicative first of the near source phenomena and second of the destructiveness that these motions will inflict on every kind of structure. And uh, look at this, look at the spectral demand um, over 1G uh, for up to 1.5 um, uh, seconds. And okay, let's go and um, have some comparisons to to understand what 
uh, this destructiveness means and um, how it compare with other world known big earthquakes. Uh, this is the Norci earthquake to our neighboring Italy uh, in a matrice, maybe uh, you have heard of it, uh, more than 100 uh, victims. Um, there are uh, two or three earthquakes happened uh, in 2016 uh, in this region, over six, and you can see one um, record. It's, it's smaller. Here uh, from Lixuri, this is uh, from Greece, uh, 2015. Uh, okay, well, we can see here that it is, let's say, uh, quite better. And maybe these are very well known to you. These are notorious. These are the uh, Newhall and the Rinaldi uh, uh, records, uh, response spectrum uh, of the 1999 Northern earthquakes. These are world known uh, response spectra. And you can see, um, I, I mean, Rinaldi is probably one of the worst response spectrum in uh, worldwide. And you, you can see that this Turkey's uh, Antakya response spectrum, it's even larger than Rinaldi. And if we want to really beat it, uh, we have to go to Japan. We have to go to Japan if, if we want to beat it. Uh, this is the JMA and the Takatori with the um, um, magenta and uh, the purple uh, from the 1995 uh, Kobe earthquake and the Masiki from the Kumamoto 2016 earthquake. Uh, only these records can really fight uh, the Turkey. And to sum up, these are um, all the elastic response spectra uh, from uh, the recordings that were uh, close to the epicentral um, uh, region um, and to the surface uh, of the rupturing. And you can see the extreme ground excitation. What do we mean with that? We mean spectral response value greater than 1G with this bold uh, line. And that happens for a vast number of stations, not just for one or two. Look at how many, how many records are uh, giving um, response uh, spectrum um, uh, up, upper than uh, 1G. And also for a large period range, where not only uh, lower than uh, 0 0.5 uh, seconds, we're talking about up to two up to two seconds, this is an extreme case. We're not familiar and we are we're not used to this. And let's go now to the third part, which is um, the result of these extreme motions. The damage, the damage in civil infrastructure, the structural and geotechnical. Let's start with the uh, structural. Uh, this is a map with uh, the cities that were more uh, devastated by the earthquake. Um, let's start with uh, the, no, let's start with Ganziatep and Osmania that they're close to the epicenter. That's why I'm starting with that. And then uh, we move on to Kahraman Maras and Turkoglu there. And then we go to uh, the Yaman and Malatya and Malatya up north. And then uh, there are the Antioch and the uh, Hassa uh, cities here. And of course, unfortunately, Syria were also devastated by this earthquake in Idlib and Aleppo. And these are the uh, pictures that you all are familiar with. These are what the uh, news are showing. Um, we have collapse of buildings. Uh, this is from the Kanharamaras. This is um, a central avenue, and you can see um, the, um, the total collapse, uh, the total fail of buildings. But also, we can see from the picture, we can observe that they're not all flattened out, thankfully. There are some, uh, some uh, structures that they're still standing. Maybe, uh, maybe some of them. 
uh, they are damaged and maybe some of them that they're still studying uh, have to be uh, demolished. But they're standing, that means that uh, the people could um, uh, survive and uh, get out of them. Here is uh, the picture, that's uh, the picture from Antakya, unfortunately a heavily damaged city, maybe, maybe the most uh, heavily damaged. And this is uh, an indication of why that happened, uh, because we have large uh, acceleration in many parts of the Antakya, um, a form, a type, of uh, failure, of structural failure, was the pancake collapse of multi-story buildings like this. You can, we can see the, the slabs, one on the top of the other going up. And that's another one in Hatay. You can see the slabs here. And nine-story building in Kankraman Maras. Um, another one in Malatya. Uh, and unfortunately, not only for uh, apartments, but also for uh, hospitals, um, yeah. uh, tens of hospitals were uh, partially or totally damaged. Uh, this is from Inskenderun. Uh, a part of it uh, was collapsed. This is what happened. Uh, we have to say uh, here that there are um, more than 10 hospitals that were base isolated and that were not damaged from the earthquake. So um, I know that uh, uh, Professor Costantino from the University of Buffalo uh, visit this uh, hospital uh, for which um, many of them, he was the one who uh, studied them and uh, see their response. So uh, there are not only bad news, but good news also. These are the bad. And another type of uh, apartment failure, um, on the uh, ground floor, um, the whole weight of the building was uh, uh, making with the inertial forces, um, the um, columns failed and the whole building uh, was taken down. And let's go to some, um, to see the distribution of the structural damage from satellite observations, from NASA, from Copernicus, from the European uh, Satellite Agency, and from EOS, this is the Singapore Satellite Agency. Uh, three uh, villages, Nurdagi, Kankraman Maras, and Turkoglu. Um, let's uh, see in more detail the case of Kankraman Maras, which was very close to the epicenter. And uh, with red is um, the places, the locations where there is definite change in the, um, in the uh, landscape. So uh, there is definite uh, collapse, there are definite damage. When you see uh, yellow or orange, we're not as definite uh, if damage occurred. But uh, you can see the distribution of the damage in the uh, city of Kankraman Maras um, focused mainly on the center of the uh, city and the parts which uh, was built close to the uh, mountainous region because up uh, here up north is uh, mountains, so it, it was not the whole city that was uh, damaged, thankfully. Uh, another case, this is uh, for the Antakya. Uh, in Antakya, here is the Antakya, and we have a uh, mountain here and also a uh, mountain here. And you can see that almost uh, all the um, uh, the city is um, is damaged, and uh, from Reuters, some damage statistics for the city of Gaziantep. Gaziantep is uh, to the center of the um, of the faulting zone, and it's a big city. Uh, Eleven percent of the buildings were compliant with the Turkey seismic codes. Almost half of them were partially compliant. 
and 38% were not compliant. And from them, 63% were reinforced concrete and the rest, 37, were built with uh, unreinforced masonry. Uh, in summary, uh, the Turkish Ministry of Environment and Urbanization and Climate Change uh, reported that 164,000 buildings were partially or severely damaged. This is a huge number. Uh, from a total of 20 million buildings in Turkey, almost 50% were constructed without following the seismic cone. And I want to state in that, um, in that part that unfortunately the Turkish government uh, gave amnesty, a uh, construction amnesty uh, many times in the recent years. And this, is, this was not very helpful. And unfortunately, the United Nations estimate of reconstruction cost for Turkey, uh, it's close to uh, $100 billion. That is a huge disaster. And let's see some before and after uh, picture. This is a newly built 16 story building in, in the port of Iskenderun before and after. We can see the damage. Another case that, um, was quite famous because of the footballer, the Christiana Chu footballer that stayed in this hotel uh, after a match. Um, this uh, hotel, it was a luxurious hotel um, located in Natakia. This was um, the uh, hotel before the earthquake and after the earthquake. Unfortunately, um, many, many victims. Uh, another hotel, 12 floor uh, hotel and another eight uh, story uh, residence hotel. And let's go uh, to um, a Christian church. You can see that our God unfortunately didn't help us and Allah the same in Yeni Mosque. The structural damage in Syria was um, also of the same of the same nature. Uh, this is from Itlib, flattened. This is flattened, and and unfortunately they also have uh, the civil war. So um, it was really a very bad coincidence. And here uh, the total collapse, uh, the total collapse of buildings. And let's go uh, into some more detail in some observation about the structural damage in multi-story buildings in Turkey and Syria. Let's look at this. What we observe, we observe first very thin columns. These are thin and no beams. We see flat slabs and we are in an earthquake prone region. Flat slabs were not feeling uh, very good with that. And um, no uh, sear walls, uh, small signs, uh, columns, which I mean, this size could probably be inappropriate even for one or two story building, not for more. And this is another case in Idlib, Syria. Let's focus on these parts that are highlighted. First, look at here, up, we can see the flat slab, no beam, no sear wall, just a column. And you can see here the plastic hinge uh, that is formed. And down here, very few rebars, very small. and uh, here on the right, uh, you can see how the column is punching the slab. And you can see here, this is not a monolithic joint. This is not how joints uh, should be reinforced. Um, here, another case, let's focus on the uh, vertical column and just see the stirrups, see how first, how um, uh, thin they are and how they are open uh, from the earthquake. And of course, they could not restrain the uh, longitudinal bars. Uh, so the longitudinal bars are buckled. Another case, another case um, uh, let's focus here with the arrows are the stirrups, the sear reinforcing um, uh, steel, which is opened. And then uh, the uh, longitudinal rebars 
uh, very small and buckling. And here the joint, just look at this, look at the joint here. Uh, this is the uh, column and this is the uh, slab. No beams and look at the poor reinforcing at the, um, at the joint. No anchoring, uh, no monolithic um, um, reinforcement, unfortunately. And this is another case. I want you to, to, to see this because uh, as we see the picture on uh, the left is the collapsed building and on the right here, it's another building under construction. This was not finished. So let's, let's see it from another perspective. Uh, this is the collapsed and that, that uh, up here is the newly one. And I mean, uh, I was shocked when I see this picture because um, I'm not used to seeing um, uh, columns being cast in place uh, with no slab uh, on the top. Uh, and look at here, focus on uh, the small length of the longitudinal bars. What, what type of, of, of anchoring will this uh, sustain? This is the same, uh, but uh, magnified. You can see here, there are no monolithic um, joints and uh, very few rebars, uh, poor uh, reinforcing. Another case where the, um, here is the uh, vertical, um, the vertical column that penetrates the slab. Another case, let's see, just take a look at this. Look at the uh, stirrups, one here, one here and one here. They're not close enough. And not only they are few, but they're also very thin. So they opened. And of course, um, poor longitudinal bars thin also. Um, the transverse reinforcement are uh, absolutely un unacceptable. Um, Let's see also this detail here. Uh, look at this on the, uh, on the left. We can see the longitudinal uh, reinforcement, but where are uh, the stirrups? I cannot see a stirrup. Fortunately here on the, on the right, I can see a stirrup here and here. They're not very close. Maybe also the gravity uh, after the, um, the failure make uh, the uh, transverse reinforcement going down there. But um, I mean, they're not uh, close enough. And of course they are open, they're open. And also no beams, no beams. And also just, just notice here how the longitudinal bars are stopped. It's like taking the scissor and going there. Also, I'm showing you this just um, to, to notice the thick slabs. We do not want such thick slabs in seismic prone region. That means big mass up there. So uh, this uh, multiplied with uh, the acceleration means large inertial uh, forces. We don't want this, especially when we do not have uh, um, CR walls when we do not have girders, we do not have beams. Uh, these are two buildings in, uh, in the borders with Syria. The one on the right uh, will be demolished uh, because as you can see here, uh, it lost some height. And the one on the uh, left is uh, still standing. And let's take a closer look. Look at this. Small, small um, uh, columns straight up to the slabs with no beams. This is not something that we want to see in seismic prone regions. And just to, to give you a visual comparison uh, with another construction, well designed, a two story building in a small island of uh, Cephalonia. After two uh, six magnitude earthquakes in 2014, not as big earthquakes. We have we have to keep in mind that when we're talking about uh, 7.8, uh, 
this is huge. This is more than double the six earthquake. So I'm not saying that the uh, excitation is the same. No, a 7.8 excitation is extremely large. Uh, but however, the uh, recorded PGAs in that case was more than uh, half uh, G. And this is how it looks. We can see it's only three floors, but however, it has large sear walls, you can see inside here the beams and the slab, and we can see here the joint, uh, which uh, could uh, behave as, as we want. And this is just to, to keep in mind what we want. Uh, unfortunately, are not all structures in Greece like this. Like this. We, we are hoping it is like this. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, after uh, the 1999 uh, Parnitha earthquake in uh, Athens, we've seen that unfortunately our uh, infrastructure uh, is not as good. I mean, unfortunately, I cannot say that if uh, such large magnitude earthquakes as the one that happens uh, in February in Kahraman Maras that we uh, would not have problem in Greece. Unfortunately, I'm sure that we would have. But this is what we want to build. This is what we feel uh, confident with. So the reason of extensive structural damage. First, the natural hazard, the extremely strong seismic shaking. We can't do anything about it. It's a sequence of three large earthquake events, 7.8, 6.7, 7.8 in nine hours. You cannot beat this extraordinary large ground acceleration over 1G and PGA is very large. We cannot do something for it, but we can do about the other part, which is the human factor, the engineering practice, sometimes, unfortunately, malpractice, uh, structures not compliant with Turkey seismic codes in that case, and inadequate structural system. In more detail, uh, when we're talking about malpractice in uh, the uh, structural um, systems, we mean very thin columns and rather thick slabs, a bad combination, very inadequate and poor steel reinforcement in size and number of the longitudinal reinforcement. Also in the sear, in the transfer uh, reinforcement, inadequate density, improperly tied, that's why they open the stirrups, and no beams. This structural uh, system of flat slabs first is not recommended for uh, earthquake prone regions. And second, even if you uh, decide to do it, you have to reinforce properly the joints and the columns in order uh, to behave um, uh, plastically and not uh, brittle. Nowhere to be seen sear walls, unfortunately, even for um, more than 10 story buildings. And let's uh, close with the, the geotechnical damage. I see the time and I know I'm late. Uh, okay, we have some landslides like this. This is close to East Haye. Um, this is the landslide. Uh, also, some uh, landslides, small landslides, closing the roads. And uh, this is a video uh, going to the media with uh, an oil uh, field that was um, formed some grabbings like this. And they're saying this is fault, this is not fault. This is um, a type of a landslide, a, a type of soil failure. It was not uh, fault rupturing. And um, seismic uh, subsidence in the port of the Iskenderun, after the fault, uh, it uh, subsidized and you, you can see the flooding. You can see the flooding here. Uh, soil liquefaction, of course, in such extreme um, uh, accelerations, we have uh, soil liquefaction. You can see here uh, the sand boil. Uh, and here, this is uh, very close to Kahraman Maras and Turkoglu. And here, uh, this was a road, this was um, a road on top of an embankment. And as the embankment uh, laterally spread, 
due to liquefaction, this was uh, destructed. Also in the fields of uh, Syria, uh, in the uh, free field um, soil liquefaction, like this, bearing failure at the mud foundation. Let's look at this. This is um, a quite interesting case. A topic building in Gilbesi in Adiyaman district up north, we're going and we can see this toppled house. If we move closer, um, we see the details. First, the structure seems intact. The glass windows are unbroken, no cracks, not even in the foundation. And that's what we think it, it happens. Um, there is a bearing uh, type of failure in the foundation, and this is just toppled and uh, sits on the neighboring building, just like that. And these are cases that um, occurred in the 1999 Adapazari earthquake and are very well known in uh, literature. Many of you may know about it. And let's finish with the emergence. These are the, <coughs> the hidden uh, part of the, uh, this earthquake, the emergence of the fault on a uh, ground surface from site observation, but also with interferometry and satellite imagery and mapping. Uh, this is from the uh, European uh, satellite uh, study from Copernicus. And uh, this is the Elbistan here, uh, the second uh, earthquake, 7.7. .7, and down here is the big one, the 7.8, with uh, the um, blue color is three meters to uh, the left and with uh, the red is uh, three meters to uh, the right. Permanent ground deformation. So in this line here, that means that uh, the satellite um, here recorded um, almost five to six meters of um, relative displacement. And this is from USGS, also from satellite imaging from NASA. Um, where you can see the blue is where we are sure where the surface rupture emerge on the surface and we observe it. Uh, with the red is the place where we, uh, we are waiting to see the fault, but we didn't see it. So uh, just compare uh, the one on the top, which was the one in Elbistan, with not emerging of the fault in the surface, uh, on the surface where um, the, the big one, the first one earthquake of uh, 7.8 uh, in a large length of it was emerging uh, on, the soil, on, the, on, the, on the ground surface. And these are some pictures. Um, this, this one is uh, outside Turkoglu and this uh, road was uh, cutted this is a strike slip fault, remember, left lateral, uh, three and a half meter of dislocation. Uh, here, uh, outside Turkiglu, uh, the fault offset as it is captured. Uh, this is a better view of the same thing. This is the fault trace. And of course, the train, um, the train um, tracks was uh, buckled, as you can see. Um, here in Terkerveli village outside, also the trace of the uh, surfacing fault. And this is very close to the epicenter. This is the splinter of uh, a tree uh, in the uh, Tertilik village, which is very close to Pazarjik. This is very close to the epicenter. So uh, trees with the roots, it's like let's say the structural analog to us is what? Is a structure founded with piles. And we have a permanent dislocation, which is the rupturing, going and hitting uh, this pile foundation. And as you can see, uh, it um, split a bit. This is another, another view. Look at this tree here, it's smaller. And that's why uh, it is uh, splintered and it's moved the other part five meters up. 
This is also very close to Pazarjik. Uh, we're going uh, down to uh, Hassa, um, a, a city. We see the fall offset of one and a half meters, another offset here from the other view of the tiles. Uh, here also in uh, a road in Hatay, the biggest uh, documented offset and measured. This is close to seven meters and it's up. It's uh, very close to Malatya. And uh, you, you can see in the fence, the, the offset. Here, uh, almost three and a half meters in the road. And I want to end these, um, let's say, pictures of uh, destruction with some, uh, I hope, um, positive uh, vibes. Uh, this is a 16-year boy uh, that was survived three days after the earthquake. And, and you can see him and all the rescuers smiling, and not only people, even animals. So I'd like to thank you very much. And before asking you for questions, I'd like uh, to um, just to say um, that uh, Professor Gazetas uh, want me to give he, his regards to your, um, some professors that uh, he is very fond of, to Ian Baku, to Manus Margarakis and to Said Saidi. I don't know if they are in the, in the audience, but he wanted me to, to say his uh, regards to these people. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for being late. Uh, maybe you have remarks, questions, anything you want to talk about. Thank Arsa. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Guarini, for your comprehensive and informative presentation. Thank it was you. very nice. Of course, it was kind of scary and sad to see all those heavily damaged buildings completely collapse. Uh, but uh, let's move on for Q&A. So yes. if you have any question, uh, please uh, move forward. Use the reaction button. And you can also put your question in the chat box. I already see some questions here. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can start with uh, the chat and box. And uh, sorry to interrupt you, Arsam. I, I, I was, um, while I was uh, talking, I, I saw um, a hand. Uh, yes, which was someone had up, a question, I guess. I, yeah. I, I didn't know if I had to stop the presentation or not. So I didn't know how to respond. To oh, it. yeah. So probably we uh, get the question again. But uh, there's, some, there's a question in the chat box. Someone is asking mm -hmm. uh, how the engineers in the affected area were aware of the building codes and seismic codes because you showed a lot of uh, like engineering flaws, like low syrup, uh, like very thin rebar. So mm -hmm. is it because they were not aware of it or they are just violated the code? Well, uh, I will uh, just want to go. Okay, let me go. This is a very good question. Uh, I just want you to see this. This is the uh, seismic hazard mark uh, from the Turkish code. So I think that the scientists and uh, the seismologists and the civil engineers and the structural engineers they are very well aware of the um, seismic hazard uh, in Turkey. Uh, this North Anatolian fault and East Anatolian fault are well-known uh, regions of high seismicity, and they knew that, and that's why they put these high uh, design values. Uh, so if um, the uh, seismic code, the Turkey seismic code, um, was followed, uh, we would probably won't have the same uh, results. Of course, we have to keep in mind that we are dealing with extreme events and with not one, but three of them, three of them in nine hours. I mean, it was not just the first event because many of the uh, structural collapses that we've seen, uh, it was not for, from, from uh, the first, it was the first, then one hour after this, um, um, a 6.7 uh, earthquake occurred. Nine hours later, uh, a 7.8 uh, 
five earthquake uh, continues. So this was a triplet of earthquake, a large uh, number of earthquakes, of, of, of major earthquakes. So, um, I mean, uh, myself in my practice, and as far as I know, we are not designing for a triplet of earthquakes. We are designing for a, an earthquake with some probability of exigence. Um, I'm sure that if more structures were compliant to the Turkish seismic codes, we would not have as many human losses as we have. Now, the malpractice is a problem, and it is a well-known problem in Turkey, because as I told you, um, the Turkish government gave structural amnesty more than once in the last five years. That means that they, know, they knew that something was not according to the codes, that something was happening. But uh, of course, you know, if you have as large population as Turkey has, Turkey is more than um, uh, 80 uh, million right now, more. They're close to 100 million. There are a lot of people. They're needing houses. Uh, so they're um, uh, constructing these, uh, these cities in very short uh, time. I'm not trying to say that uh, everything was well done. And I'm not wanting to say that uh, everything was wrong and it's their fault that this happened. No, um, as scientists, as civil engineers, we have to recognize the facts and just put them out. I think that if, uh, for example, all these malpractices in, okay, I see now, um, hand if um, these malpractices in uh, reinforcement um, was avoided we will not have this uh, brittle type of collapses and at least the people uh, should have the time to evacuate so i saw someone raise his hand so please uh, just unmute yourself and ask your question otherwise uh... We have still some question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. I don't see any raised hands. So uh, it was Douglas uh, da Darling or um, Cameron Marks. I don't know. This wolf eyes. <laughs> nice. So, uh, OK, so let me just ask you another question in the chat box. Uh, someone asked, oh, we have another uh, mm -hmm. person who raised his hand. So please go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Uh, thank you for your uh, perfect uh, presentation. I, I have a question is that uh, when you talk about the structural damage, uh, you talk about, you explain it in the, based on the reinforced steel and uh, no beam reason and joints, uh, no good uh, joint, uh, joint design in that perspective. I understand that, uh, but uh, when you explain the geotechnical uh, damage, uh, I remember you just showed several photos for the damage of the foundations and soil liquefaction in some, and some photos. So could you please provide a, a little bit detailed uh, based on something like soil mechanics theory, just like you explain the structural damage you based on the, like the steel and the reinforcement theory. So is there any, related theory such as soil dynamics or soil mechanics in that perspective to explain the geotechnical damage instead of just uh, the, the, the photos for, for that damage. Uh, well, did, did, uh, I yeah, did I yes. explain? Thank you very much for uh, asking. Us. Uh, I, I didn't have the time uh, to, oh. to say uh, about these things. Well, first, uh, the let me go to the uh yeah i think it's around page uh, okay one, uh, yeah. One, ten, uh, one, twelve, yeah well first uh there are um a vast number of landslides numerous landslides in such large earthquakes uh we have um a vast number of landslides uh these are uh close to the mountainous areas. Uh, we know they have lacustrine uh, soils there. 
uh, we have the uh, soil um, uh, profiles. Um, this is, uh, for example, this one. Uh, there was a dam here, and this is the um, the lake beside it. And fortunately, this uh, landslide happens at the end of the um, of the lake of the dam, so the dam was not affected. Uh, and also, there are a number of dams in these areas. Uh, fortunately, uh, the Ataturk Dam, which was a great dam, was not uh, heavily affected, just a small cracks. Um, in terms of um, some more soil specific effects, yes, we've seen some uh, soil amplification uh, potential. Sorry, some soil amplification potential sites in Kahraman Maras and in Antakya, but uh, right now we're, wake, we're working on that, doing the uh, amplification and the amplification analysis. Um, just to show you um, one or two profiles, because um, maybe you're a geotechnical engineer and you want to, to just to see the profile, to see what, what happens. Uh, okay, just, uh, let's go here. Here, here, here. Let, let's see some uh, profiles. Okay, so uh, can you see this? Okay, so uh, for example, this is from Antakya, and this is a soil profile um, 30, uh, the 30 upper meters from uh, the results from um, Maso and the other ones from uh, Remias waves. And uh, you can see the soil um, and I can show you uh, just a minute to take this here. Uh, to, take, to take you look at an, 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 another uh, soil profile. Uh, this is a better one. As you can see, uh, more than uh, 40 meters per second. This is a shear, a shear wave velocity with depth. So this is not a bad soil profile. This is a medium soil profile, but uh, in Antakya, unfortunately, uh, we have um, even lower than that. Let me, no, this one, this one is much softer. Uh, and in order uh, to, um, to meet the, the rock, let's say, the more um, uh, healthy uh, soil, the uh, more stiff soil, we have to move uh, lower than the uh, 50 or 60 meters. Uh, the upper is, um, uh, is, is quite soft and where uh, the same, um, um, the same picture is true from the Kahraman Maras. I, I do not have the time to show you here, uh, but um, in uh, Antakya and in Kahraman Maras, uh, we are um, we are studying uh, about uh, soil effects and about valley effects, which are more of a geotechnical uh, nature. Uh, but I do not have uh, right now um, uh, some results to show you. Okay. I don't know if I, if I answer your question. Yes, I, I, yes, yes. An, an, another observation for me, uh, I know that um, there are some people uh, in the US, not only, not only in the US, that they're very fond uh, with liquefaction. Uh, well, um, for such, large events, liquefaction was not as detrimental as uh, in some other cases. For example, in the Christchurch earthquakes where liquefaction was everywhere or in uh, some other uh, um, uh, Jap Japanese events. So uh, liquefaction was not detrimental, maybe because it was in the fields and no one was uh, caring about that. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Gorini. Uh, I regret to say we are almost run out of time. We still have some questions in the chat box. So do you mind if uh, uh, they ask you through email maybe later on and you can uh, just help them? Of course, but, of course. Uh, great, so thank you everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy this 
uh, informative presentation. It is uh, recorded, so the recording can be uh, published later on. So feel free to email me. I would put my email in the chat box. So uh, if you need the video, you can just email me and I will share it with you. And uh, so by this, I think that's the end of the presentation. Once again, thanks you so much for being Thank here. Thank you very today, much for inviting me and for so, all of you for being here and uh, for uh, being interesting in Kamharman uh, Marazar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you.